Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rattorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today, I am very happy. I am joined by Isasu Velaz del Berga Guinea from Lero Primates Rehab Centre, and she's going to be talking all about the work she does with primates. Um, so, Isasu, if I could just hand over to you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you got passionate for primates, and how you got involved with the organisation. Thank you, Kathleen. So, yeah, actually, since I was a kid, I really love all the animals. So my dream was always to work with animals of uh, any kind. So I didn't really have a, a preference for primates because I think that any species is amazing when you start to, to know them, no? So, yeah, I studied environmental science because I also was kind... I wanted to work in conservation. So, and after that, because I wanted to link conservation and ethology, which were my two biggest passions, I, I started the, the master on primatologies because at the time I didn't really know any English. So the closest to me was primatologist in Barcelona, yeah. And so what was your background? How did you then move in from being passionate about wildlife to then actually getting to work with conservation? Yeah, so after my master in primatologies, I went to, to Mexico to study howler monkeys for a year. And then I get uh, a little bit in the um, uh, research uh, area, no? uh, doing publications and doing data collections and all that. And uh, then I moved to Guinea, Guinea Conakry. I studied in uh, chimpanzees in Nimba Mountain. And after that, I was kind of directed to do a PhD, even if it was never been my, my objective, my aim, but my life kind of bring me to the research area. So I came here uh, to Luiro to actually prepare my PhD in Great Ape Reintroduction. And then for several reasons, yeah, what I, uh, it was going to be six months is now more than seven years. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the way, isn't it? You, uh, yeah. you get dragged in by your passion. So mm -hmm. if people are watching back home and they're not really aware of what your organization is doing and what it does, can you talk to us a little bit about what it stands for? Yes, yeah, so Luido is a rehabilitation center for primates uh, mainly, but we also accept other kind of wildlife. So anything that Congolese authorities, ICCN, uh, arrive to confiscate, then uh, we accept them to rehabilitate and hopefully release back to the wild. And uh, yeah, but as I say, we are mainly a primate sanctuary rehabilitation center, but we also have other kind of wildlife like parrots, uh, turtles, and a porcupine. <laughs> And so with um, if we if we go in, I know you deal with a lot of um, primates and, and as you were saying, other other animals as well. Um, but if we're looking specifically at chimpanzees, um, now they're one of our closest relatives yet classified as endangered. Um, what issues do they face and then how do you combat that? So, yeah, in almost all across their habitat in, in Africa, the, the dangers are the same, deforestation, uh, hunting, bush meat, and pet trade. But uh, in our area, the, their biggest um, issue is the hunting, illegal hunting for bush meat. Uh, here, people eat the adults as bush meat. And uh, the, if they find a, a baby chimpanzee in the group, then they try to sell it as a pet, thinking that they will get more money selling it alive than eating because I mean in their mind there is no much meat in a baby. And then who are these people that are purchasing these animals for pets? I mean do they, uh, it's a huge undertaking the chimpanzees should never be pets of course. Okay. Um, do they come in kind of blind because they're cute and then they think they're uh, and then they get into trouble when they're older? What's the situation there? Yeah I think they don't really know what it means to have a chimpanzee in their house. 
Uh, chimpanzees, of course, all of us are agree that they are super cute when they are babies, but uh, immediately when they start getting two years old, they are st almost stronger than you already. And it's impossible to get them, you know, like uh, quiet or they need like, of course, like a wild animals there are, uh, they need to, um, the forest, the family, others to play. So when you keep a, a chimpanzee all alone in a house with human companion, it's actually crazy because uh, you become crazy and they become crazy. So it's, it's really a bad idea. And I think people doesn't know what it means to have a, a chimpanzee in their houses. So I, I want to think that is ignorance you say in English yeah. yeah and then what about as well I know that in um, some countries across Africa um, they use them in the tourism industry as well as a way to kind of get money by getting chimpanzees to act like humans um, what kind of situations have you seen here and then how do you kind of combat that yes yeah, so we have a recent case that it was like that Tarzan he was used to, yeah, to the people was going to see him and pay money to the family, and then he will perform some kind of, actually quite rude, like uh, masturbation and uh, drinking alcohol, smoking, and those kind of things. I don't know why people think that's that's funny, but he was living in a attached to a two meter maximum chain, so all his life, 25 years. He was all alone in these two meters of uh, space. So actually, one of the things that I think is more important for people to be aware is like without demand, they will not be offered. So the problem is these people paying money to see Tarzan or any other monkey to take a selfies to to this kind of tourist industry, if I can put a name. But yeah, if everyone needs to be aware that if they don't give money to these kind of attractions, they will stop. Yeah, 100%. And then how do you find out about um, these situations? Uh, do you have like a network of people on the ground? How typically do you get involved? So it actually depends. Sometimes it's just people uh, that find a, find a chimpanzee and they know about us. Other times it's organizations that we collaborate with, uh, mostly conservation organizations, locals, Congolese organizations. Other times it's ICCN, the Wildlife Authority. So it actually depends, but uh, it's true that we, are, we always need to support uh, logistically because Congo is a huge country. So it gets, yeah, sometimes it gets hard to arrive to where the chimpanzee is and then bring the chimpanzee to Luiro. So it's why most of the times we need a plane to be able to bring the chimpanzee to, to Luiro. I mean, that kind of feeds quite nicely into my next question because I know that there was a, a video that went quite viral of um, one of your pilots um, flying in um, Musa, the baby chimpanzee. Um, Obviously, the work that he's doing is incredible and he's bringing them to you. Um, do you find that this helps create awareness of the work that you're doing? Um, and also kind of on the on the other side of that, how do you ensure that people are watching this and rem remain aware that chimpanzees are not meant to be cuddled and petted by humans? Yeah, it's a tricky and um, yeah, very important question. And I need to be honest, I think a lot about this this issue because of course I want to make it right. But first of all, we didn't know that that video was going to be viral. For us was also a surprise. We were just showing a part of our job. And uh, then suddenly it boom, it went viral and we were as surprised as, yeah. So um, I think this video, it's true that we have received some critics about this video, but uh, for us, at least on my point of view, I received a lot of tons of messages saying like, thank you for opening my eyes. I didn't know this was happening. Now I am aware. Um, and I think when you go out of your daily followers, know that they are somehow educated, you are you have always this, this risk, know that the people start using this, the videos that you publish as 
like you don't want them to use it, no? But and I'm sure that this video was used maybe sometimes to to give another message, no? But um, I think mostly, and I want to think that mostly create a lot of awareness. Also, more and more people knew about our job because people started to hear Luiro. And uh, it gave us also the opportunity to, to spread our message, you know, to tell everyone what, what is going on here in Congo and uh, what is going on with chimpanzees. So, yeah, it has both sides of, of the coin. Yeah, I mean, social media is a very powerful tool for um, creating awareness and that kind of thing. And I think I know a lot of different organizations, yourselves included, um, are also continuously saying, you know, that these animals are not pets. They should not be kept as pets. And I think the more people understand that, the more people become aware. Are you seeing a change of attitude to, um, in people towards how chimpanzees are kept or primates in general? Uh, I think so. And I think more and more people are aware because, yeah, all the sanctuaries are doing an amazing job uh, doing awareness about what's going on. But uh, it's sad because sometimes we also receive messages about people wanting to buy a chimpanzee or a primate that, of course, those messages give you the opportunity to, to explain to those people why it's not a good idea to buy a, a primate, no? But it also makes you think, no? Uh, is, how, are we really giving the message in the right way? Why these people is writing us asking a, a primate to to buy, no? So yeah, sometimes it's hard to deal with social media in, in that sense. Uh, 99 of our followers are educated people, as I said, and I we know that they, they get the message perfectly, but of course there is always those people that, you know, they, yeah. For sure. I mean, we had a comment coming through from Emma Louise Edwards, and I think she kind of sums it up nicely. And she's saying, you're never going to please everyone. But she's also saying you're you're doing an amazing job and to keep it up. And I think that is basically how it is. Um, you know, there's always going to be critics. There's always going to be people um, trying to twist things. And it's just you have to keep going and remain positive um, in the situation that you're in. Um, now, with your work, what, what would you say? Do you have such a thing as a typical day? And, and what does your work involve regularly? No, actually, no. And it's what I like most of my, my job, that every day is different. So one day I can be taking care of a new arrival. And other day, social media, um, fundraising, grant writing, uh, integration is a very... I love integration because it's with... Uh, allows me to spend more time observing the animals. That is kind of my my passion. And uh, it means that when a new animal arrives after quarantine, you need to put them in a group, no? And that pro process is, depending on the animal, uh, in, on the individual, is sometimes harder or easier. So, yeah, that's a big part of my job. And then, uh, const I mean, no, I, I, I don't do the construction, but I design how it needs to be together with the team, uh, yeah, awareness. So, yeah, it's my job is very diverse. And you mentioned earlier that you take these chimpanzees with the hope, again, to get, to get them wild. Um, how does that process work? Because if they've been used to being habituized to humans, is, is there a process that you go through to get them to be less uh, dependent? Yes, yeah, so actually when a baby chimpanzee arrives to us, they are totally traumatized and both you know, mentally, but of course with uh, physical problems most of the times. So our first job is to give this chimpanzee, this baby, the, the assurance you know, that they are now in good hands, they, they can stop being scared and uh, we need to provide that love was taken from them when they killed their mom. So that's absolutely no discussion needed. So it's very important, the role of the surrogate mother. And it actually, there are some studies that they have been done with baby chimpanzees that they let them sleep alone and compared to the ones who sleep with the, the surrogate mother. And it shows that 
it affects to the personality, to the development of this animal, the animal that is all 24 hours with a keeper, then they will be more secure of themselves. It's like us, like humans, no? Like the, of the baby humans also need that contact, that love. So after that, after the animal is stabilized, after the chimpanzee is feeling, and you see like at the beginning, they are quiet, they are very calm, they are sad. And then you start seeing that they are starting to play and they are starting to be a real chimpanzee, you know, and it's when you say, okay, you are ready to be with other chimpanzees. And then they go to the nursery group after the quarantine, of course. And in this nursery group, they start to meet other baby chimpanzees. And um, slowly, slowly, they get to, you know, to interact more with the, with the others and less with the mamas. And then after that, then they go to the forest and closer with older chimpanzees. And at the beginning, the keeper will be with them 24 hours because, of course, it cannot be uh, a rupture. No, it, it needs to be progressive. And then we need a, a, a adult chimpanzee to take care of this baby chimpanzee as the mama, human mama was doing. So it is, it is a process, but at the end, the chimpanzees don't need human care anymore. And they are kind of, yeah, in, well, in the wild, in a forest enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about um, what your organization does is you work very closely with the local communities. You've got an alternative livelihood program. You do conservation education. Um, Typically, what's the opinion of the work that uh, with chimpanzees and primates? How do the community see it? Have they and have you seen them kind of change the view at all? Yeah. So from the beginning, uh, the organization who started the, to run the sanctuary thought that it was very important to to connect the community with the wildlife. No, it, you cannot really take care of the animals in an environment like ours without taking care of the community. So since the beginning, they have been both wildlife projects and community projects. And of course, the ECS is to, we want them to see the benefit no, of conservation too. So we provide, of course, a job position. We have 55 Congolese workers and uh, we buy all the food from local farmers that is about $1,000 per week that goes directly to the local farmers. So that way they see the direct benefit from the sanctuary. But also we do um, community projects, as you say, like to create lively alternative livelihoods. And that is very important because we are not in a position to judge them because we we have never been hung hungry and our kids most no, likely they will never be hungry. So yeah, in order for them to stop depending on the forest, they need alternative. So it's why we work with them to listen to them. So what kind of other alternative will you like? So you don't need to go to the forest and hunt or, or cut uh, good trees or anything like that. And we've got a question coming through from uh, Francisco, and they're saying, how do you see the conservation of chimpanzees in the coming years? Are there goals to work on more than others? Uh, sorry, because I was reading another, say again, I was reading the, the one who is in the... <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, they're asking, how do you see the conservation of chimpanzees in the coming years? Are there certain goals you need to work on more than others? So we need to try to be positive, but uh, it's true that more humans, more pressure on the on the resources, on the natural resources, and one of the biggest problems is that, no, that the, the humans, we are more and more, and uh, we are eating the forest and uh, letting the wildlife without anywhere to live, no. So I think the most important is to conserve this last forest that we have and uh, because of course the wildlife need where to live no so we really need to stop this deforestation this habitat destruction 
So I think everyone needs to be involved in that. Of course, uh, it's not only Africa. These resources are being cut to to fit uh, Europe and America. No, so any everyone needs to be involved in this. In this, and you need to be aware of what kind of uh, furniture are you buying. No, if the good is coming f with a um, a certificate, no, that it tells you that is not being cut from any forest in Africa. So I think every one of us, with our daily uh, consumption decisions, we can make a difference. And uh, kind of following on with the work that you do with the communities, again, one of the, the things I, I really admire about your organization is your like empowerment of the communities. Now, I know you also do a program where you um, hire people in the community that have come from a sexual abuse background. How did this come about? What was the situation here? And then what was the, the drive for this? Yeah, so actually they say that the Eastern Congo is the worst part of the world to be born as woman, no? And due to the, the war situation, the insecurity, the instability, there are a lot of women who have suffered this kind of uh, abuse and violence, no? So we come across with a woman that uh, was brutally raped. And um, yeah, we she was amazing. So we told her, do you want to work with us? And uh, it was, it's a beautiful story because uh, she said herself, uh, I, I, I have been rehabilitated while rehabilitating baby chimpanzees, no? Yeah. And it, go, it went the both ways. So at the beginning, when she started to work with us, she, she kind of was, of course, was a bit of, scared of humans because mm -hmm. what she happened to her. And at the same, she said herself, like, I feel so identified you know, with the chimpanzees because they have suffered as well as me. So it becomes like that, like the, she started to work with the, the baby chimpanzees and she started to feel better and better. So she was improving herself and uh, yeah it's how it started and then we had other ladies like that too so it works well in a way that it helps them also to to rehabilitate somehow i mean i think it's such an incredible program and i, and I think people are, are very supportive and appreciate the work that you guys are doing not just for the animals but for the communities as as well and um, we've got a question coming through from gina and she's saying, do you do anything for monkeys that get taken from their mum and are kept as house pets and abuse? Um, and I, I think following on from what she's asking, I'd like to know as well is, do people willingly give up these animals or, or is it a fight to, to get through it? Yeah, usually it's a, an awareness work. No, you go to the, someone tells you there is a chimpanzee or a monkey here. And uh, then you go with the Wildlife Authority, ICCN, and uh, you start a negotiation, no a negotiation, we never give money because we never will buy a, an animal, but you start explaining them know how this is illegal, there is a law, the Congolese law doesn't allow you to have this animal in your house. So yeah, it goes, and at the end they they understand and yeah, they they sur they give you the, the primate, no? they give to the authorities. They don't have any other options, so they need to do it. But uh, one of the problems that I find here is the lack of law enforcement, no? Because these people are committing an illegality, no? Is is uh, is not so they they should be punished somehow. So and it's what I am missing here, no? That the people doesn't get punished for their actions. It's all about awareness and sensitization. And uh, yeah, I want to I want to start seeing more. Uh, like uh, yeah, like prison punish and yeah, economical punishment to these these people. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I'm guessing the reason why you never um, pay for these primates primates um, is because you don't want to kind of uh, fuel a demand where people are then taking them so they can know that you guys are going to pay and get them off them. Is that the case? Yeah, exactly. And actually, it's funny because they always or they often say, no, 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 you need to pay me back the money I invest in this animal, no, because I, I have been feeding them or I, 
I have spent certain money in the cage or whatever, and it's like, no way, you are not receiving one penny. And it's what you say, you know, if you start paying for the animals, then you are the poacher, no? you are the, the dealer. You start to create this business around you that uh, we have seen it in other countries uh, where people, to, of course, I am... I understand like there are some tourists here also that they have seen uh, an animal, a primate on the road and they feel so sorry and then they want to buy the animal to save him or her. And But that's totally wrong. You, you cannot never ever pay for an animal because then you are just continuing with the business because if you buy that monkey then they will go and and take another monkey from the forest to to buy to sell it to another tourist so yeah. never ever buy a, a wildlife a wild animal i think that's such an important message because often people are doing it for the for the right reasons but then without realizing the consequences of exactly. their actions so i think yeah. what you're saying is such an important message um, now, obviously, the work that you're doing, you mentioned earlier, I think you said it was $1,000 a week to feed the, the, the animals. That's an incredible amount of money. Um, so what, how do you um, raise the funds for this? And kind of following on from that, how can people support you to make sure that you can continue the work that you're doing? Yes, yeah, so actually, we have some grants no, from Brigitte Bardot, for example. We have a powerful um, donors like uh, Ivan Carter Wildlife Foundation. And, um, but actually in the last years, the, our biggest, um, our, uh, so it has been the people, no, has been the individual donors that they have been supporting us. And actually amazingly with the, we lost some, some grants. So it has been thanks to the people that uh, we have, we we could continue our work. So it's it's just it doesn't need to be big amounts like five, ten, fifteen dollars. But when a lot of people donate ten dollars, it makes a world for. It. So yeah, it's, it's this kind of small big donations, no, that that allows us to to keep running. And we got a question coming through um, from Melanie. Uh, she's a big supporter, and I know that she's obsessed with uh, chimpanzees as well. Um, and she's asking, when will be the next giving day for apes? Yeah, actually, thank you, because uh, I wanted to say that, that the giving day for apes has... I, I, I don't even have words to, to say that thank you to everyone who is involved in this day is the biggest fundraising event for, for us. And this year is going to be the 12th of October, uh, but early donations starts the 13th of September. And as I say, this, so for example, last year we got funds enough to run for seven months. Imagine the, the, the tranquility, no? the, to, be, to have in the bank seven months of running costs so yeah, this this day is very important for us to get the salaries for the local people, to get the food for the animals and all the small maintenance that we need every day. So yeah, it's the 12th of October. <laughs> and what's the process? So say someone wanted to to take part in, in donating, is there like a website or what what's how does that work? Yeah, it works in our platforms. Uh, and soon in the 13th of September, because I start the early donations, we will be sharing this link. Uh, so no worries, because it will be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then obviously we can't talk about it anything without discussing COVID at the minute. Did you find that you were struggling with um, people who may, uh, you know, like you've got your private investors who might be struggling now to donate or were you seeing that people were doing more um, taking the chimpanzees to raise money? Did you did you see any changes here at all? Yeah, at the beginning was very hard uh, because we saw you know, that some grants were cancelled. Even if they were approved, they, they cancelled it like from one day to another. So it was money that we already count on it, no? So, but then again, like people has been amazing. Like we weren't expected this a given day last year, no? Where we we did the record of 
all the other give, uh, giving days. So yeah, again, it doesn't need to be like big big amounts, but if a lot of people donate small donations, that's that's what we need actually. So yeah, it's, it's thanks to the people that we have been, we didn't have any economical problems actually to, to keep running. And, and then um, did you see an increase in, in the illegal wildlife trade or was things pretty much the same as usual? Yeah, unfortunately there was. And uh, not only an increase, but also we had a lot of problems to transfer these animals because of course, um, planes could not fly, cars could not pass from one province to another. So yeah, it was it was hard for several months. Um, okay, so I've only got one more question left. Uh, if you're watching back home and you'd like to put a question to Isaso, then please do so. I can see that there's a couple coming through, so I'll do those in a minute. Um, and if you are watching this back home, please do like, comment, share. The more people that see this, the more awareness we can raise for the work that they're doing and hopefully keep the organization well supported. Um, so for me, I always like to end things on a positive. I know conservation can be a little bit bleak at times, so I like to try and focus on, on the positive as well. And I'd just love to know what your favorite success story was. Yeah, so it's hard to, to choose one because <laughs> all of them are... I mean, the transformation of these baby chimpanzees from when they arrived to where they are now, no, it's amazing. Like, for example, Makasi, you know, maybe a lot of people remember her. She wouldn't let me touch her for six months, no? And uh, now she's, yeah, in the nursery group, and now she's accepting the human care. And of course, with the chimpanzees, she's better, so... But uh, maybe if I need to choose one, will be Suena, because Suena was 14 years alone in a cage. And um, yes, yeah, she, she arrived totally traumatized and uh, with a lot of social issues. She will not know how to interact with other chimpanzees. He was quite uh, violent, aggressive towards people and chimpanzees. So it took us four years to be able to, to put him in a group. So now he's living with seven other chimpanzees. And I, I, I think that's amazing. And even if he will never go back to the wild, because he, of course, he has some issues, but at least he's able you know, to live in a social group and be a chimpanzee again. So, yeah, Svena will be my favorite. And I think that's important as well, as I, I think a lot of people don't realize just how much time it takes to and um, effort and love to put into these animals to get them to be re, uh, rehabilitated. You know, chimpanzees are incredibly complex animals. They are very, very close to humans. And when something terrible, if they've been treated terribly, they they feel it and they, they obviously have that trauma. Um, so I guess for you to see them go from that to then being a, a, a proper chimpanzee must be an incredible feeling for you. Yeah, yeah, it's what keeps me here, I think, to see the, that at least for these animals, we are doing something, yeah. yeah. And we're so grateful for the work that you are all doing, so thank you so much. And um, we've got a question coming through from Leslie, and she's asking, where will the chimps go when they get older? We have all chimpanzees. Eh? We we don't only have babies. It's just like yeah. So our aim is to to let them free, no? Again, in if possible. As I say, there are chimpanzees that they have trauma that they will never get rid of. So they will not be able to survive in the wild. But those who could survive in the wild, we would like to. Is our objective not to be able to to let them free again? And then we've got another question coming through from Claudia Eva, and they are asking if someone gets reported to the authorities for keeping a primate, will the authorities actually follow up and check it out? Is there enough manpower to do so? And then what happens to the animal? Yeah, unfortunately, no. There is not enough manpower and. Um, we know about animals in remote areas, uh, especially little primates, little monkeys, 
that they are suffering in the hands of humans. Um, but yeah, there are too many cases also for only us. No, I mean, at some point, you need to understand that you are not going to be able to save all of them. So we focus on the ones that we can save. And uh, hopefully, yeah, in the future, we will have more people, more sanctuaries maybe, and uh, that will help us also to to rescue these animals, like Jack Sanctuary in Lubumbasi. The, they are starting to rescue monkeys too. So for us, it's a relief because uh, we know about so many monkeys that they are in the hands of humans. So yeah, we need more more support on that on that sense. And is there a way for people um, who might not be in the country but are watching this and want to kind of support? Um, is there a way to kind of lobby governments to get them to be more proactive on this, or is it just a case of just trying to raise awareness and make people more um, engaged and proactive? Yeah, I think it's the second. No, the second that I think yeah, Congo is a huge country and it has issues on their own, no? not only on wildlife, but uh, a lot of corruption and uh, human human violence too, no? So, yeah, I think is that we need to create awareness around us and uh, especially what I said at the beginning, without demand, it will not be offered, no? So, especially if we cut that, then at least the, the international market, the international trafficking will stop. So I think it's, it's that one, yeah. I think as well. So if you're watching back home and, and you're feeling passionate about the work that they're doing, as we were saying earlier, social media can be an incredibly powerful tool. So it's a great way for you to, if you're finding organizations that you want to support and be passionate about, um, to promote them, to tell people, to educate them, um, a lot of tourists aren't really aware. It, the, it's, it's increasing and it is slowly getting better, but a lot of people aren't aware of what these animals are going through to be an attraction. And as you say, take that demand out and then hopefully you're going to start seeing a decrease in those animals getting taken from the wild in the first place. Yeah, and as you say, and also the, I think we need to report no, every single uh, profile on Instagram and Facebook, we are seeing a lot of profiles with chimpanzees performing or monkeys being dressed up and those kind of videos. So we need to report them. And so maybe Instagram and Facebook will see that people are caring about this and then maybe they will uh, stop you know, letting these people show those kind of videos because they are promoting pe uh, primates as pets too. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, okay, so that's everything that we've got for today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've really enjoyed having you on. Um, the work you guys are doing, as I say, for both the animals and the community is absolutely amazing. You've got some great stories and I've absolutely loved hearing them. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Uh, no, I think we had all, all say. Just, yeah, let's remember about the giving day for apes <laughs> that yeah we would love to see the, all of the all of you involved this year too <laughs> we've got one more question coming through and i think i know I'm, i think i know what your answer is going to be but what is your greatest motivation to fight for their lives day by day yes for me is is to see them know how they arrive that they arrive broken to see them a smile again to see them play, to see them laughing, for me is is what keeps me here. And uh, because yeah, I know that for Usiriki, for Pusaraka, for each of them, I am changing their life. No, and maybe we will not be able to save the species, but we are saving these these individuals who yeah who have yeah they are each of them is they are very important. Yeah. I love that. You can actually see the passion on your face as you're talking about it. It's absolutely lovely. And we've had some lovely feedback coming through as we've been talking. Lots of support, lots of encouragement and people enjoying what you've said. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone back home as well from watching. Um, we really appreciate it. As we say, like, comment, share. 
more people that see it, the more awareness we can raise. Um, and if you've liked this conversation, then please do come and like and follow What Does the Giraffe Say Media. We've got many more interviews up and coming. Um, we're actually going to be on pause throughout September as I'm on, uh, on holiday, but I'm back in October and we will be bringing more conversations and conservation stories to you. Um, so thank you so much for coming on and thank you everyone back home for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.